studies in weeks before Christmas are sometimes from the first of December to Christmas Day. The word Advent means coming or arrival in Latin. And this is the coming of Jesus into the world. And Christians use the four Sundays and weeks of Advent to prepare and remember the real meaning of Christmas. Not what the world says Christmas is, but what God's Word says about Christmas. The word Christmas means Christ worship, Christ, Christ Mass. Mass means to worship. And so it, it's a time of us coming back into focus of our faith, of our values, how that we are to examine ourselves because we are in this world, but we are not to be a part of this world. We, our citizenship is in heaven, by the way. And so there are three meanings of the coming that uh, Christians describe as Advent. And the first one is the one that happened 2,000 years ago, the arrival or the appearing of Jesus Christ as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem who came as a man to die for you and for me. The second one can happen now as Jesus wants to come into our lives now. It comes in first through the new birth. You come to Jesus because you have sinned. You are a sinner. You ask Jesus to forgive you, and he arrives to redeem you as the Redeemer. And he lives in you day by day, so that every day is a sense of how that we have this experience with Jesus anew and afresh in our lives every day. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And each day is a new opportunity to experience Jesus' presence in our lives day by day. And through this time, where naturally secularization has taken what is a religious holiday and turned it into cash market, and they do quite well during Christmas season, but we as believers can walk amidst the cacophony of the music, the sounds, and everything that's going on, and can come walking into the presence of God, even in the midst of our work day. On the job, God's presence can be there, interrupting your thought process with the idea, I'm with you. And you can whisper a prayer. Nobody has to see it. Nobody has to be alert to it. But you can be doing your job very effectively and, and, and doing your job very uh, conscientiously and still have the presence of Christ in your life, experiencing the joy of His appearing again each day to make Himself known to you and to me. And the third is yet to happen in the future. When Jesus will come again, with great power and authority back to earth as king and judge. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of God to Israel? He said, it's not given you to know the times or the seasons which the Lord has purposed in his life. But you shall receive power, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. So Advent is not only the arrival of Christ to the church historically, not only the arrival of Christ to our lives individually through redemption, but it's also the arrival of Christ with the anticipation of his return and the commission to go out and to share the message of what Christmas is really about. It is about the birth of salvation, the birth of hope, the birth of redemption, the birth of promise, the birth of eternal life, so that those who come can know about this same Jesus and he can make his arrival in their lives as well. That's why God has called us to be witnesses in this world. We are to testify of the hope that's within us by the those who ask us. Give them the reasonable answer why we are a follower of Jesus. And so number one, if we fill in the blanks, is coming to redeem. Christ is coming to redeem. And, and the importance of that then is this. What takes place in this passage of scripture that we read here? In this passage of scripture we read, we find that uh, the miracle of the importance of Advent is that to Mary, who is a virgin, the angel comes to her and says, you're highly favored. The presence of God is upon you. You're going to give birth to Messiah. And Mary says, I'm, not, I'm, not even, I'm just engaged. I, I'm pure. I am, I am a virgin. And how is this going to happen? And his response is that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And that which is born in you will be conceived of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Christ, the eternal Logos. And the Word was flesh, and the Word dwelt among us. He goes on and says, And the, He was born one of a kind, Malachi's. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The phrase only begotten is a Greek word, Malachi's, meaning one of a kind, not to be duplicated. 
are replicated. So he's unique that he's fully God and he's fully man. This is the miracle of the incarnation. And so we find this, the, the word becoming flesh, God becoming flesh. So he comes and the, and the word says that you will conceive. And then he says, and this is his purpose because you will call him Jesus. The Lord is salvation. That's what the word means. Jehovah saves. Every time you say the name of Jesus, Yeshua, you're saying, God, my Savior. When you hear somebody that, uh, that, uh, that uses that name in a derogatory manner, I remember one time my wife said, do you know him? I said, who? Jesus Christ. What? He's my very best friend. He's my Savior. See, the world uses Jesus' name in so many perverted purposes and manners. But to them, it is just a phrase to use. But to the believer, it is my Savior. Jesus, Yeshua, my Savior. His name shall be Jesus. And there is an advent impact that takes place in rival. He, unparalleled faith is his alone. Because the message is he shall be greater than all. Greater than all? You mean greater than Abraham, our father? Oh, yes. Jesus says in John, to those who are challenging him, before Abraham was, I am the chapter of John. You're not even 50 years old. How can you say this? Because before Abraham was, I am. I am that I am. Here he came. He should be greater than all. The demons knew him. They screamed out, have you come to torment us before our time? He tells them, be quiet. The work's not yet finished and accomplished, but you know what's going to happen. He casts them out and they go screaming. People are set free and delivered because he shows up. But through his resurrection, that power of the Holy Spirit is given to the church so that at the name of Jesus, those powers of darkness fall and fail. And he is the unparalleled claim, unparalleled claim of his alone. Son of the Most High. Son of the Most High. What's greater than that statement? Nothing. Everything else is lesser than, lower than, weaker than. But the Son of the Most High has all power and authority and He commands and everything in heaven, earth, and even hell obeys. For all power is His. You see, it's interesting because even in Daniel chapter 9, it talks about the work of the Messiah. And the Kurum Kays, manuscript 4Q246, written at least 150 years before the birth of Jesus Christ said this, He shall be great upon the earth, O King, all people shall make peace, and all shall serve Him. He shall be called the Son of the great God, and by His name shall He be hailed as the Son of God, and they shall call Him Son of the Most High. Even before His coming, they had defied Him. The prophets of old defied Him. The manuscripts of the New Testament just spoke with hope of Him coming and what He would be called and he came and he fulfilled that promise. So his coming was to redeem. To pay the price to purchase us. No power can meet the level of that price to be paid for you or for me. Not the most wealthy king in the world. Not the greatest armies that ever marched upon this planet. Not the most prolific Political systems that could pass laws of emancipation could do this. Only Jesus could redeem us from our sins. Because men can be set free by legislation. People can be ransomed by money. But who sets you free from yourself? Only Jesus. He makes you not only forgiven, but a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, they are the new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. What powerful words are spoken in that. We're set free. We're redeemed. We are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. The second point that I want to talk to you about 
is Christ coming to reign, to rule, to reign. It is a divine right given to him. You see, in the ancient days of monarchism, kings gave the right of succession to their eldest son. This happened in ancient times, in biblical times, it happened in medieval times, it happened even in the times of the monarchies before the movement of democracy began to take place in parts of the world. And it was always the heir who would come, the heir apparent who would come. And so the divine right, they said, was given from king to his family's succession, generation after generation. But see, even monarchies come to an end, but not his monarchy. Of his kingdom, there shall be no end, the scripture says. It's a divine right, because the angel says he shall rule on the throne of his father, David. In the, in, the, in the historical sense, David, then Jesus. In the biblical sense, in the theological sense, God, David, God. Because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God and all things were created by Him. So he has this divine right. It's only been established. He's coming from the very beginning. You see, what does this go to? It goes all the way back to the fall in Genesis. Did you know that? The prophecy of Jesus coming goes right there to Genesis chapter 3. Now you know the story, Adam and Eve were created. God created Adam and then he created Eve. And God says, here's your life partner. And this is how we got the name woman. He took one look at Eve and said, whoa, man. Thank you, God. So we got woman out of it. Now, don't go look at any reference anywhere, chronologically or anything else, and a thesaurus or anything like that. I just said that. And I did it within the three minute limit. So it's a sense of understanding that they made them, but sin separated them. And they lost their place in paradise. And the Bible makes this reference to this. He talks about, Paul writes about a first Adam and a second Adam. The first Adam brought death, the second Adam, Jesus brought life. And so paradise is lost. We know the story. But as they are getting ready to be cast out of the garden, God gives them a promise. Genesis 3.15 is called the Proto Evangelium, or the first message of evangelism for salvation. He says this, your seed, not generations to come, but the one, your seed will be bitten on his heel by the serpent, but he will crush the serpent's head. And what God is simply saying there is that when you think all hope is gone, there's still hope. When you think everything is lost, there's still gain. When you think that you have really failed, there's still renewal. You may have blown it in your life. You may have failed miserably. Well, that's in your genes. Your mom and daddy did that way back in the garden. It did it to us all. All have sinned and come short of God's glory. But here is the story. God says, I will restore that which has been taken from you, Adam and Eve. You gave it up. My son's going to get it back. And so there is this like a rain, like a wedding band. There is this God's communion with Adam and Eve. There is a separation. There is a sin like a divorce from mankind, from God. And they go through this whole process. But then God sends his son who dies on the cross and redeems us from our sin, restores the fellowship and brings us back to a new heaven and a new earth. The first Adam and Eve and the second Christ and his bride, the church. The story of redemption, the anticipation of his coming. And so Christ came to reign and the dynamic might involved in all of that. The center of his kingdom is the house of Jacob. Why does he say that? Because that's both validation and authentication. He has the right to be the king. He's from the family of Jacob. Validation is there. His birthright is secured. He fulfills prophecy all the way through. And then he says about the circumference of his kingdom. It's universal. It's universal. That's the reason why that when Jesus arose from the grave before he ascended to heaven, he said in Matthew 28, chapter, verses 18 through 20, all authority has been given me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Go into all the world. Why? Because the world's his. The earth is the Lord, the fullness of the sea, and they that dwell therein, and the sun is declared before he ever came. Everything belongs to Jesus. And he said to the church, You have been redeemed, now go and preach redemption to those who are perishing. That's why on board a ship, a young lady from China who has no faith because she had never heard his name, let this preacher be there on that ship so that I can introduce her to the name that is above every other name. Amen. Hear the cry of this young lady so pleasant. I don't know who he is. I have no faith. How many people around us don't know who he is? They've heard the name. They've seen some movies. They've heard comedians make fun of him, disparage him, do everything they can to dissipate his character and his reputation. They've had people say to them his name when they've been angry and cursing and spitting venom at them. And then they hear the name of Jesus and they think of themselves, well, this is a name that I would not want to know. But when you know who he is, you will want to know him because he will birth faith in you. And every day, I pray for that young lady who I probably will never ever see again, but I pray that when she gets home to China, there are Christians all over that place, somebody will come to her and lead her to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe as she read the steps to Christ, she will come to know Jesus. But I am praying that one day in heaven, I will see Shao Shao. And we will both worship Jesus yes. together. So it is universal all over the world, but it's also eternal. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will be rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Jesus is called our wonderful counselor. You ever need somebody to help you de decompress when you've had a rough day and there's nobody around to talk to? It's called prayer. Have you ever been one who needs guidance and says, I need a counselor to guide me? It's, and there's nobody there but just you. And you said, I need counsel. How do I get it? Go to this book. It's the Word of God. You don't open it and look for loopholes, you look at it for direction. And find out how you can serve God. He is the mighty God. You know above every situation you face, God is in control. The Bible said no weapon formed against you will prosper. He is the everlasting Father. I remember the day when I held my father's hand and he died. I remember when I looked at him the last time as I committed him to the earth. And he's with the Lord. That day I became an orphan, but not really, because I have an everlasting Father. Yeah, yeah. I have an everlasting Father. Yeah. And when you're troubled, how can you get peace of mind? You go to Isaiah 9, and he says, he is the Prince of Peace. The old song, peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit, wherever I pray, in fathomless of blood. Well, how does it happen this way? And quickly, first of all, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul is telling the church to be like Christ. He says, don't do things with faith. Being selfish, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking better of others than yourselves. And then he says, you have to have the same attitude of Jesus. The humble, holy humility of Jesus was such that he did not think he called him with God something he had on time in. But the word that is used there, he, made, he gave up his divine privilege means simply that he emptied or avoided himself. He laid aside his privilege to become human. He limited himself. He became a humble position of a slave, born of a human being. And he appeared in human form as a human being. He humbled himself. He was obedient to God. He died on the cross. And God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name that's above every knee, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow with things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And one day... In the future, all of these evil people, all these dictators, those who are dead, Hitler, Mussolini, Saddam Hussein, etc., all these people that cause whole politics and cause great destruction, they're going to bow their knee and say, Jesus is Lord. And you know what? 
Some are going to bow their knee because they have to bow their knee, and some of us are going to bow our knee with praise and glorification of God. Say, praise God, He's Lord. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And so He has a sense of not only the fact of His only humility, eternal, He's universal, He's eternal, but He is triumphant. Because at the end, at the end, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you're going through a rough time in your life, if you're facing somebody that ridicules you because of your faith, if you're dealing with situations of people who just simply say, well, you know, I haven't got time for that God thing, you know, and, and it's some kind of a myth, or they're trying to discredit you, just remember this one thing. You have in your heart the greatest treasure and the greatest assurance that anybody has. Amen. You have been redeemed. You are under the rule and the reign of Almighty God. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Master. And at the last judgment, when people are trying to give their resumes to God to get in, all you have to do is present Jesus' resume. Yes. Yes. And he says, come out of here. Because it's going to be sealed by the blood of Christ, our Redeemer. So here's the three questions we ask ourselves during this season. Number one, who do you serve? Are you serving Jesus? Totally and completely without reservation. Number two, who rules your kingdom? Do you call God in for to be your advisor or to be your ruler? I've got my plans. God, can you validate these plans? You see, he must be Lord of all or he'll not be Lord at all. So, who rules your kingdom? And here's the third thing. To whom do you bow your knee to? Think about it. Now you say, well, Pastor, why did you ask those questions? Because that's what I asked myself. I didn't tell you. I didn't write these for you. I wrote these for me, but I thought, hey, they're worth sharing. Who do I serve? Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Who rules my king? I want God to rule my king. I'm not smart enough to manage this stuff. And then thirdly, to whom do I bow my knee to? At least twice a day. Philippians 2, 10, 11, I quote, as I bow my knee on earth and profess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray.